This is the very last module for Goal 6. It's briefly going to introduce the lymphatic system and reproductive system. So again, we're going to do these two last systems. The first is the lymphatic system, and the spleen is really the only organ or anatomy part of the lymph system, but it also includes all the lymph nodes and vessels, which are very difficult to see as they're not colored or don't carry a colored fluid like blood vessels do. The immune system does return fluid to the cardiovascular system and also functions to help carry fats uh, from the digestive system to the blood, but its main function is to fight off infection. So sometimes the lymphatic system is referred to as the immune system. Its main function is to fight off pathogens. So the lymph system is a series of dead end tubes that all move fluid towards uh, the bigger uh, lymph ducts, which eventually dump into the subclavian vein. You can see in this picture here, the major lymph ducts, the upper right side of the body dumps into the right lymphatic duct, which dumps into the right uh, subclavian vein, and the bottom half of the body and the upper left side dump into the thoracic duct, which dumps into the left subclavian vein. The main organ is the spleen. The spleen has a lot of white blood cells and helps fight off infection. But sometimes people lose their spleen, it ruptures or is damaged somehow, and you can have your spleen removed and still uh, survive. The liver takes over some of the functions of it, um, but you may have a, a weaker immune system after your spleen is removed. So again, the lymph system functions to return fluid to the cardiovascular system and transport fat to the blood, but its main job is to fight off infection. And there's three main lines of defense that you have um, to fight off infection. Um, first of all, anything that can cause a disease is referred to as a pathogen, and your body will do just about anything to try to make sure that pathogen does not cause disease in you. So your first line of defense is to protect you from the pathogen getting in or on you. These are physical and chemical barriers like your skin, sweating, stomach acid, even sneezing, coughing, having diarrhea, or vomiting is a good physical or chemical defense to shoot that pathogen right back out. The second line of defense always starts with inflammation. And that can trigger things like the release of cytokines, which are chemicals that will trigger the immune system to work. Um, having a fever, which burns up the bugs or the pathogens. Um, it activates the complement. It gets your uh, heart rate moving a little bit uh, more so that your blood can move around more, which moves around the lymph, which moves around those white blood cells. The third line defense system is specific to one particular pathogen. So even though your skin and the second line defense of inflammation, it doesn't matter what the bug is, whether it's a virus, a bacteria, or a parasitic worm, the third line defense is the adaptive or specific immune response. Your B and your T lymphocytes each have a different shaped receptor to recognize a different pathogen or a different antigen of that pathogen. Basically, it requires your immune system to be able to tell what's the bad guys and what's the good guys. The good guys are your cells, so it has to be able to recognize your own cells, self antigens, they're called. So you basically have little name tags on your cells that say, hi, my name's Michelle, or whatever it is, and your immune cells see that and know not to attack. If they don't see those name tags, they assume the, that antigen is carried by something foreign, and it will learn um, by shape recognition from those receptors to attack it and trigger a specific immune response. Essentially, the first and second line defenses are set up to keep you alive long enough so your third line can kick in because it's very powerful and very specific. So the most important thing about the immune system is the ability of it to recognize what's you and what's not you, what's self, and what's foreign, and only attack the foreign antigens. Antigens are usually proteins. They're recognized by receptors on your immune cells. And basically you have to hope that you have a cell with a receptor that's gonna match every possible antigen out there. So every single B and T cell has a slightly different shaped receptor 
to recognize a slightly different antigen. So if you're ever exposed to that antigen, that one cell can get triggered, stimulated to replicate and produce a massive immune response against whatever it is you might be exposed to. So the first two lines of defense are innate. They're not specific. They're things, again, like your skin and your stomach acid, the tears in your eyes, the sweat, um, glands, the oils of your skin, the stomach acid, sneezing, those types of things, nonspecific uh, to any particular pathogen. And then the adaptive or the specific immunity is your B and your T cells, which give you the specific immune response. The main two problems of the, of the immune system are kind of like everything else. It either doesn't work and you die or you get diseased because you don't have an immune response or it overreacts. The most common overreaction of the immune system is allergies. You react to an antigen that should not be specific or it should not be uh, harmful. Other types of overreactions are autoimmune diseases, which unfortunately the only way we have to treat them is to suppress your immune response, which means you get sick with everything else. So the lymph system is a system of one-way vessels that carry fluid back to the blood system. That lymph fluid goes through nodes, like little, which act like little filters to help trap the bad guys and fight off infection. The chemicals released by these cells to communicate all this are referred to as cytokines and most of the symptoms that we feel when we're sick are a result of these cytokines. For example, histamine is a cytokine released by basophils. It causes mucus production, difficulty breathing, the itchiness of hives, so we take antihistamines to try to block it. White blood cells, specifically the B and the T lymphocytes, are the ones that have receptors that match specific antigens on pathogens and can be um, stimulated to replicate and attack those via the specific immune response. This only happens if the first and second line defenses don't destroy the pathogen before you get to that point. And that is pretty much the lymph system. The very last system, and the only one you can live without, is the reproductive system. Of course, the main organs depend on whether you're male or female here. So males have testes, women have, or females have ovaries. And then everything else is considered secondary sex organs. The purpose of the reproductive system is to produce gametes and then to support a pregnancy in the case of females. It has no role in maintaining homeostasis. And until the other body systems are working, usually the reproductive system will not. There are also many, many different kinds of reproduction uh, examples in the animal and plant world. So we'll talk about them briefly here, but this you will get into much more detail in College Biology too. First of all, there's both sexual and asexual reproduction. Asexual doesn't require a male and a female. Pretty much you just split in half and now there's two. Bacteria do this, for example. Even many protozoa uh, can do this. Sexual reproduction requires a male and a female, and usually production of sperm and eggs. And each of them are, have half the DNA, or are haploid, and when they get together, create a diploid organism. So some types of asexual reproduction, like I said, bacteria pretty much just split in half. That's fission. Um, bacteria do this. Um, some protozoa do this. Some yeasts or corals actually bud. Uh, there's little outgrowths that then separate and become a new organism. There's also parthenogenesis, and this is basically when an egg develops without being fertilized. Bees, wasps, and ants can do this, and so they're actually clones of the egg or the female itself. When it comes to sexual reproduction, there is hermaphrodism, which occurs when the animal has both male and female parts. Some earthworms, slugs, tapeworms, and snails are hermaphroditic. And then there's male and females mating, but even that can be quite different as well. For example, sometimes the male and the female don't have to be together. For example, female fish can lay eggs and the male later will fertilize those eggs. So the male and the female don't have to necessarily be in contact. 
the advantage of sexual reproduction is the mixing of genes. So you get some from mom and some from dad, and the combination is different than either mom or dad. So asexual reproduction, you can get more offspring, usually quite rapidly, but with sexual reproduction, you get um, a variation, and that means some will survive in different conditions compared to others. So there's a disadvantage in the fact that it usually takes longer and you don't get as many. All right, a couple definitions you should know about reproduction. Ovulation is the release of eggs. In some animals, this is seasonal. Um, it's usually uh, in countable days, for example. Ovulation in females takes place usually every 28 days in human females, um, but this is different for every animal. Fertilization is when the egg and the sperm meet. So you can have ovulation, but not have fertilization. So fertilization is, again, when the eggs and sperm meet. This can be both outside the, the body or inside. Like I said, fish, it's mostly external fertilization. And in humans, it's internal, for example. The rest of the reproductive information that we're going to talk about here, we're going to focus on human uh, anatomy and physiology, because that's what this section is about but there is a good animation at the end you should check out to compare some different animal uh, fertilizations. So there's a picture of the female reproductive system, uh, the uterus, the cervix, and the vagina, or the birth canal here. You can see in this uh, slide on the left, and then on the right, this is face on. Notice on the right side, you have an ovary on each side, and the ovary um, is not physically connected, but when the ovary releases an egg, it's caught by the fimbrae of the fallopian tubes and travels down towards the uterus. Fertilization actually takes place in the fallopian or uterine tubes in the female human. Okay, so the sperm travel up through the vagina, the cervix, the uterus, and some go right and some go left, but only one ovary ovulates every cycle. So if it's the right ovary, then fertilization would take place there in the right fallopian tube. During a tubal ligation, the fallopian tube is cut, cauterized, or somehow blocked so that the eggs can't travel down the tube and therefore not get fertilized and prevent a pregnancy. This is the male reproductive system. You can see the um, Sperm are produced outside the body in the, in the human male, and that is because they need to be kept cooler. Um, if it is too hot, the sperm will die. So sperm are produced in the testes, and this takes 60 to 100 days, and men produce sperm uh, continuously from the time puberty on. Sperm then travel through the seminiferous tubules, the epididymis, and up through the vas deferens. The vas deferens is what actually enters the body cavity itself, goes across the bladder, you can see, and meets the ejaculatory duct at the same place where the seminal vesicles and the prostate gland are. The prostate gland and seminal vesicles secrete some fluids, both to neutralize the urethra and also keep the sperm healthy. It then goes into the urethra and the bulbal urethral gland will secrete some fluid right ahead of that that helps with lubricating the end of the penis. But the sperm now travel down the urethra and out during ejaculation. Okay, the um, penis itself is made up of uh, va very vascularized uh, tissue, the corpus cavernosum and corpus spongiosum basically swell with blood to create an erection and without erection and ejaculation, men are considered infertile. The vas deferens is what is cut, cauterized, or blocked somehow during a vasectomy, and that prevents sperm travel from, from basically sperm from traveling up and being ejaculated. Sperm are still made, okay, and in no way is testosterone production affected necessarily here, um, but it prevents conception. So sperm and eggs are both produced by meiosis. Because remember, meiosis, the product 
is a haploid cell, a cell with half the DNA. So in spermatogenesis, when puberty uh, begins, the spermatogonia cell are initiated to become primary spermatocytes. And from that point on, meiosis occurs. So primary spermatocyte undergoes the first step of mitosis and you end up with two, sorry, meiosis, two secondary spermatocytes. After you go through meiosis two, you end up with four spermatotid, which eventually mature into what we know and see as the tadpole shaped sperm. The differentiation from spermatotid to sperm is what takes place in the seminiferous tubules and the epididymis during that maturation pro pro um, process of 60 to 100 days. Okay, so spermatogenesis occurs starting at puberty and continues until the man dies, unless there's something, uh, some disease that goes, that causes problems with the testes or testosterone production. But in females, oogenesis, um, basically all the oogonium or the primary cells that are going to exist, exist when the female gets to puberty. At puberty, once um, that process starts, the primary oocytes are, start to do meiosis. And several of them will be induced to do this, but only the, the main one or the largest one uh, will actually be ovulated. But in the first step of meiosis, over here in spermatogenesis, you get one primary spermatocyte and you get two secondary spermatocyte. But in this case, the division is uneven. So in female, that primary oocyte divides in meiosis one, but only one of the cells gets all the cytoplasm. The other cell, referred to here as a polar body, is just the DNA and it degenerates because it doesn't have any cytoplasm to keep it alive. That secondary oocyte then, the process stops because this is what is actually ovulated. So it's released from the ovary, it gets caught by the fimbrae of the fallopian tube and starts to travel down the fallopian tube. It will not undergo the second step of meiosis unless the sperm is there and fertilizes it. So if there's no sperm, the process stops and it is lost during menstruation. If a sperm is there, it will induce meiosis too. That egg then um, is produced in another polar body because again, one cell gets all the cytoplasm. And immediately the two nuclei fuse, the nucleus from the sperm, which is the head of the sperm, and the nucleus of that secondary or of that oocyte and now you have what's called a fertilized egg. Okay, so it's still in the fallopian tube and that fertilized egg is now referred to as a zygote. That zygote, um, it takes about 24 hours before anything will happen. It's gotta get all this crap together, I guess, and get organized. And then it will start to divide two cells, then four cells, then eight cells. Once it gets to about eight cells and that cleavage process is happening very rapidly, it's referred to as a morula. And it's towards the end of the fallopian tube, getting pretty close to the uterus now. And when it gets to the, or when it gets to about day five or six, it's referred to as a blastocyst because now it becomes a ball of cells and the inner cell mass of that ball becomes the baby and the outer layer of the ball becomes the trophoblast, which is going to be the placenta. The main job of that blastocyst on day six to day six to day seven, so a week after fertilization, is to attach itself to the uterus. That process is called implantation and it is difficult. Okay, um, it doesn't always work. So they think that only three out of five um, blastocysts actually attach um, and if it doesn't have a good attachment or implantation doesn't work it's not going to form a good connection to form you know the placenta and the umbilical cord and the baby would never survive anyway that ball of cells implants it starts to uh, replicate and it undergoes a process called gastrulation to form three layers of stem cells at the end of two weeks 
Okay, so at this point, um, implantation has occurred, gast gastrulation has occurred, and you have the stem cells. It is now called an embryo. That embryo um, will undergo all the differentiation and specialization of functions to get pretty much every organ system organized and ready to go. And at the end of that eight weeks, even though the, the organism is only an inch and a half big, give or take, it's got all the major organs, even eyes and fingers at this point. So the embryo stage is where the most development is occurring. It's also when something could go wrong because that rapid multiplication of cells and mitosis and specialization, if anything goes wrong, a whole organ system could be, could be goofy. So you're most likely to have problems during embryonic development. If implantation works, the next most dangerous part is uh, embry embryo stage. At the end of eight weeks, all the major organ systems are working and developed. Um, the only one that is not developed very well is the brain. And in humans, the brain continues to develop even after the birth of a child. But it is called a fetus from week nine until the end of gestation. Pretty much everything just gets bigger from that point on. So if you look at this picture, there's the oocyte, the secondary oocyte that was released during ovulation. Fertilization occurs. Okay, so now it's called a zygote at day one. It starts to replicate. Then it's called a morula here when it's eight, 16 cells. And it becomes what's called a blastocyst, this hollow ball of cells. That inner cell mass there is what's going to become the baby. And the hollow ball is going to become the amniotic fluid and sac and, tr and placenta, and then you have implantation that has to occur. Okay, at the end of two weeks, you have an embryo, or it's called an embryo, and at the end of eight weeks, you can see it's a little miniature baby. All the parts and organ systems are there and starting to work. So again, the reproductive system is only uh, working after all the other systems work because it's not required for uh, development or for growth and homeostasis. The primary sex organs are the testes and the ovaries, which make sperm and eggs. Everything else is considered a secondary sex organ. It either assists in the travel or production of sperm or eggs or in the maintain maintenance of a pregnancy. And fertilization, you should know, takes place in the uterine tubes in humans and initiates the completion of meiosis of the egg. This is a great little uh, link here. It's a video about how sex is determined in different animals, and I think you will find it very interesting. So take some time to watch that uh, when you have a chance. So some of the things you should know, the three lines of defense, the difference between a B and a T cell, um, or at least the specificity of them, what the primary sex organs are in males and females, where does fertilization take place, and the five stages of development. And that is the end of goal six.